Chapter Twenty Nine of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter Twenty Nine. Something concerning the many portals to the icy domain of King Gelidus and the difficult task of choosing the right one how bulger solved it our farewell to the cold-blooded goldicorps schneeboule's sorrow at losing us as bullibrain had once remarked when there are many doors it's a wise man who knows which is the right one to open and this i found to be the case when i attempted to take my departure from the icy domain of his frigid majesty gelidus king of the goldicorps for there was a baker's dozen of galleries in each of which upon exploring it i came after a tramp of half a mile or so up against a lofty gate of solid ice curiously carved and fitting the end of the gallery as a cork does a bottle no doubt you are wondering why i didn't make my way out of the Coltycorpian kingdom by following the river for the very good reason that it went no further than king gelidus's domain emptying into a vast reservoir which apparently had a subterranean outlet for its thick covering of ice always remained at the same height the king's quarrymen were ordered to hew an opening through whichever door i should point out as the one that i wished to pass through but i was informed by frosty fizz that according to the law of the land but one door could be opened during any one year so that if i found my way blocked and turned back again it would mean a delay of twelve months bullibrain with all his wisdom was powerless to assist me although i was half inclined to think that he might have done so had he been permitted to investigate the secret records of the kingdom carved upon huge tablets of ice and stored away in the vaults of the palace the fact of the matter is king gelidus was so desirous of having me assist at the marriage feast of princess schneeboule that he threw every obstacle in my way that he could without openly showing his hand then schneeboule herself by the dancing of her clear gray eyes gave me to understand that she too was hoping that i would make a mistake when i came to point out the door which i wanted open bulger saw that i was in trouble but he couldn't comprehend clearly what the trouble was he kept his eyes fastened upon me however watching my every movement hoping no doubt to solve the mystery while sitting one day lost in thought over the very serious problem which i found myself called upon to solve an idea struck me i had noticed that in the meat quarries the workmen often made use of sounding rods which were long pieces of polished bone ending in flint tips a coltycorpian quarryman by dexterously twisting his rod was able to bore a hole six feet deep or more into the solid bed of ice when desirous of ascertaining the position of a carcass in the meat quarry and it occurred to me that by piercing the portals of ice which close their various corridors i have spoken of possibly bulger's keen scent might recognize that current of air which would have in it the odor of earth and rock in other words make choice for me of the portal which opened on that corridor leading away from the icy domain of king gelidus and not merely into some outlying chamber of his kingdom his frigid majesty could not object to such experiments for the law only forbade the hewing of openings large enough for the hewer to pass through king gelidus and half a dozen of his courtiers looking stern and frigid and conversing in freezing tones were present to see the experiment tried methought their icy lips clacked together with satisfaction when at my request one portal after another was pierced but bulger after sniffing at the hole turned away with a bewildered look in his eyes as if he didn't half understand why i was ordering him to thrust his warm nose into such cold places and so we tramped from corridor to corridor until the quarrymen began to show signs of fatigue and the sounding rod turned slower and slower in their hands frosty fizz blinked his cold gray eyes as much as to say little baron thou must bide with us for another year but i merely turned to the quarrymen and ordered them to pierce one more portal of ice ere we abandoned the task for the day they went at the work of piercing the eleventh door with the pace of pack mules up a mountain side but at last the sounding rod bored a way through and at a wave of my hand the quarrymen fell back in an instant bulger had his nose at the hole and took three or four quick nervous sniffs ending with a long deep drawn one and then breaking out into a string of sharp jerky joyful barks he began scratching furiously at the bottom of the portal your frigid majesty said i with a low and stately bend of my body such as only those born to the manor can make 
by this portal at the coming of to-morrow's sun i shall pass from your majesty's icy dominion and when frosty fizz and glacier boy heard these words of mine uttered so loftily their eyes gleamed cold as steel then they followed the king in silence back to the palace of ice schneeboule met them in the grand hallway and when she had looked upon their faces she began to weep for she loved me and she loved bulger too and her cold little heart could not bear the thought of our going king gelidus however soon recovered his spirits and ordered a feast with song and dance in honour of bulger who during the festivity sat on the highest divan with the softest pelt beneath him and so many were the frozen tidbits which the culty corpse presented to him during the progress of the feast that i grew alarmed lest he might overload his stomach and not be in a fit condition to make the early start on our journey of which i had given notice to the culty corpian monarch but his good sense saved him from doing so foolish a thing in fact i was greatly amused to see that while he accepted every tidbit handed to him and solemnly went through the motions of chewing it yet watching his chance he slyly dropped it out of his mouth and flirted it aside with his paw thus was spent our last night at the icy court of his frigid majesty and on the morrow the colty corpse collected in great crowds on the different terraces to say good-bye i pressed a kiss on the cheek of princess schneeboule when it had turned to ice crystals one of her men brushed it into an alabaster box prince chillychops the former lamp trimmer was on hand with the rest of the colty corpian nobles but i flattered myself that schneeboule loved me better than she did him however i wished him joy and gripped his cold palm with such warmth that he stood blowing it for a whole minute when we reached the lofty portal we found that the quarrymen had already hewn a passage through it and near by i observed a pile of massive blocks of ice crystal clear these when bulger and i should pass through the opening were to be used in walling it up again and when i saw this pile of blocks and remembered the solid workmanship of the colty corpian quarrymen the thought flitted through my mind suppose bulger hath not chosen wisely what use would there be in turning back for my own weak hands would be powerless against a wall built of such blocks and knock i ever so loud how could the sound ever traverse this long and winding corridor and reach the ear of a colty corp no said i to myself if bulger hath not chosen wisely it will be good-bye to both upper and under worlds and then bearing an alabaster lamp in one hand and in the other holding the cord which i had tied to bulger's collar i stepped through the narrow passage hewn by the quarrymen and turned my back for ever on the cold dominion of gelidus king of the colty corpse once i halted and looked back i could see nothing but i could hear the sharp click of the flint axes as the quarrymen closed up the door that shut me out from so many cold but loving hearts and then i drew a long breath and went on my way again and that was the last I ever saw of the Colty Corpse, save in a daydream or night vision. End of chapter 29。Chapter 30 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State, Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 30 All about the most terrible but magnificent ride I ever took in my life. Ninety miles on the back of a flying mass of ice, and how Bulger and I were landed at last on the banks of a most wonderful river. How the day broke in this underworld had my hand at that moment not grasped a cord tied to the neck of my wise and keen-eyed bulger i really believe i would have come to a halt faced about retraced my steps and begged the inhabitants of this crystal realm to admit me once more into the cold kingdom where gelidus held his icy court for a sudden fit of depression came upon me as the chilly air struck against my cheeks and i saw the deep darkness made visible by the tiny flame of my alabaster lamp cold though it might be i would have sunshine in the icy land of the colty corpse but now how could i tell what fate awaited me luckily i had asked the captain of the meat quarries to allow me to retain one of his sounding rods with its flint point for i feared lest in descending some icy declivity i might fall and bruise or even break a limb i was determined to advance cautiously along this icy passage shrouded as it was in impenetrable gloom and so different from the broad and polished pavement of the marble highway and hence 
hanging the lamp about my neck i proceeded to make use of the sounding-rod as an alpenstock for which purposes it was admirably adapted suddenly bulger halted gave a low whine of warning and turned back in an instant i knew that there was danger ahead and letting myself drop on my hands and knees crawled carefully along to make an investigation of the dangerous spot in our route signalled by the watchful bulger it was only too true we stood apparently upon the very edge of a sheer parapet how high i had no way of ascertaining but i was unable to reach any bottom with the sounding rod what was to be done turn back it was not yet too late the colty corpian quarrymen could not have completed their task in so short a time they would hear my knock they would tear down their wall of ice and gelidus and schneeboule would welcome us back to their ice palace with a cold but honest satisfaction as i sat there plunged in thought i half consciously began to twirl the sounding rod around until i had sunk it half in its length into the floor of ice and then reaching out i encircled bulger with my arm and drew him up against me as was my wont when preparing for profound meditation i had scarcely done so when the ice beneath me gave one of those sharp clear cracking noises so unlike the sound made by the breaking of any other substance and thereupon i felt the crystal mass on which bulger and i were sitting tremble and vibrate for an instant and then with a sudden downward cant break away from the mass behind it and begin to move instinctively a sense of my awful peril prompted me to cling to the sounding rod which i had sunk drill-like into the ice luckily it was between my legs and quick as a flash i entwined them around it assuming a turkish sitting posture while my left arm was wrapped tightly around bulger's body i don't know how it was done done as it was all in an instant but there i sat now firmly saddled so to speak upon that crystal monster's back as with a creak and a crash it snapped the crystal links which bound it to the wall of ice and plunged headlong down the glassy slope in my fright i had dropped my lamp and now the deep gloom of this underworld enwrapped me but no it was not so for as the escaping block of ice creaked and crunched its way along the two cold crystal surfaces gave forth a weird glimmer of phosphorescent light which made the flying mass seem like a monstrous living thing out of whose thousand eyes were darting tongues of flame as it rushed madly along now gaining speed upon striking a steeper stretch of way now fouling with some obstruction and dashing against the rocky sides of the corridor and sending a shower of crystals sparkling and glittering in the black air anon the escaping block comes upon a gentle slope and with the low music of crushing crystals slips softly along in its flight as if mounted upon runners of polished steel and then with a sudden dip it glides upon a sharper descent and fairly leaps into the air as it bounds along hissing over the slippery roadway and leaving a train of fire behind it and now it strikes a stretch of way piled here and there with clumps and blocks of ice with a mad fury it springs upon the lesser ones with a growl of rage grinding them into powder which like showers of icy foam it hurls upon bulger and me seated on its back but some of the blocks resist its terrible onslaught and our mighty steed is hurled from side to side with crash and creak as it drives its crystal corners fiercely against the jutting rocks leaving marks of its white flesh on these black heads of adamant it seems an hour since the crystal monster broke away and yet ever downward he threads his wild flight butting bumping jostling veering staggering along bearing bulger and me to the lowest level of the world within a world will he ever end his mad flight is there no way for me to curb him must he fly until he has ground his very body to such a thinness that the next obstruction will shatter it into ten thousand pieces and hurl bulger and me to death as these thoughts are flitting through my mind the flying mass takes one last mad plunge which lands it on an almost level stretch of roadway by the different sound given out by the sliding block i know that we have left the regions of ice behind us and that our crystal sledge is gliding gently along over a track of polished marble but mile after mile it still glides along gently softly silently and then i dare to think that our lives are saved but so terrible had been the strain so fearful the anxiety so exhausting the effort necessary to hold my place on the block of ice and keep my beloved bulger from slipping out of my arms that i fell backward into a dead faint as the gliding mass came at last to a standstill 
i think i must have lain there a good half hour or so for when i came to myself bulger's frantic joy told me that he had been terribly wrought up over me and the moment i opened my eyes he began to shower caresses on my hands and face in most lover-like style dear grateful heart he felt that he owed his life this time to his little master and he wanted me to understand how thankful he was the moment bulger's nerves had recovered from the shock occasioned by my prolonged faint i reached for my repeater and touched its spring it registered one hour and a half since we had stepped through the icy portal of king Gelidus's domain allowing a half hour for the time i lay unconscious it showed that our mad descent on the back of the crystal monster had lasted quite a full hour and reckoning the average speed of the escaping mass of ice to have been a mile and a half a minute that we were now in the neighbourhood of ninety miles away from the cold kingdom where Gelidus sat on his icy throne the princess schneeboule at his feet with chili chops beside her it was with great difficulty that i could rise to my feet so stiffened were my joints and knotted my muscles after that terrible ride every instant of which i expected to be dashed to pieces against projecting rocks or torn to shreds by being caught between the fleeing monster of ice and the gigantic icicles hanging from the ceiling like the shining teeth of some huge creature of this underworld but could it be dear friends that bulger and i had only escaped a quick and merciful ending to be brought face to face with a death ten times more terrible in that it was to be slow and gradual denied even the poor boon of looking upon each other for darkness impenetrable was folded about us and silence so deep that my ears ached in their longing for some sound to break it and yet there was something in the sound of my own voice that startled me when i used it it seemed as if the awful stillness were angered at being disturbed by it and smote it back into my teeth where are we this was the question i put to myself and then in my mind i strove to recall every word which i had read in the musty pages of don Fum's manuscript concerning the world within a world but i could recollect nothing to enlighten me not a word to give me hope or cheer and i was about to cry out in utter despair when happening to raise my eyes and look off in the distance i saw what seemed to be a jack-o'-lantern dancing along the ground it was a strange and fantastic sight in this region of inky darkness and for a moment i stood watching it with bated breath and wide-open eyes but no it could not be a will-o'-the-wisp for now the faint and uncertain glimmer had increased to a mild but steady glow reaching away off into the distance like a long line of dying campfires seen through an enveloping mist but in a moment's time this wide encircling ring of light had so increased in brightness that it looked for all the world like a break of day in the land of sunshine and here and there where its mild effulgence overcame the darkness of this subterranean region i caught sight of walls and arches and columns of snow-white marble and then as i called to mind don Fum's mysterious reference to sunrise in the lower world i swung my hat and gave a loud cry of joy while bulger waked the echoes of these spacious caverns by his barking i tell you dear friends not until you have been in just such a plight can you know just how such a rescue feels and now no doubt you are a bit anxious to know what sort of a sunrise could possibly take place in this underworld miles below our own well when you have travelled as many miles as i have and seen as many wonders as i have you'll be ready to admit that wonders are quite as commonplace as commonplace itself know then that this vast region of the world within a world was girt round about by a broad and placid stream whose water swarmed with vast numbers of gigantic radiate animals such as polyps sea urchins portuguese men-of-war sea anemones and the like that these transparent creatures which had the power of emitting light after lying dormant for twelve hours gradually unfolded their bodies and tentacles and rose toward the surface of these calm and limpid waters increasing by degrees their mysterious radiance until they had chased the darkness from the vast caverns opening upon the banks of the river and lighted up this underworld with a soft effulgence somewhat brighter than the rays of our full moon for twelve hours these weird lanterns of the stream made it day for this nether world and then as they gradually shrank together and sank out of sight their expiring fires glowed with all the multicoloured radiance of our fairest twilight and that night blacker than stygian darkness came back again but now twas full daylight and bidding bulger follow me i walked in silent wonder 
along the banks of this glowing stream which like a band of mysterious fire as far as my eye could reach went circling around the white marble mouths of these vast underground chambers end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter thirty one in which you read of the glorious caverns of white marble fronting on the wonderful river in the tropics of the underworld how we came upon a solitary wanderer on the banks of the river my conversation with him and my joy at finding myself in the land of the rattle-brains or happy forgetters brief description of them with every turn in the winding way that skirted the white shores of this wonderful stream its swarms of light-emitting animals lent it a new beauty for as the day advanced if i may so express it they lifted their glowing bodies nearer and nearer to the surface until now the river shone like molten silver and as the sheer walls of rock on the opposite bank held set in them vast slabs of mica the effect was that these gigantic natural mirrors reflected the glowing stream with startling fidelity and threw the flood of soft light in dazzling shimmer against the fantastic portals of the white marble caverns on this side of the stream it was a scene never to forget and again and again i paused in silent wonder to feast my eyes upon some newly discovered beauty now for the first time i noted that every white marble basin of cove and inlet was filled with a different glow according to the nature of the tiny phosphorescent animals which happened to fill its waters one being a delicate pink another a glorious red the third a deep rich purple the fourth a soft blue the fifth a golden yellow and so on the charm of each tint being greatly enhanced by the snowy whiteness of these marble basins through which long lines of curious fish scaled in hues of polished gold and silver swam slowly along turning up their glorious sides to catch the full splendour of the light reflected from the mica mirrors and now the chilly breath of king gelidus's domain no longer filled the air i stood in the tropics of the underworld so to speak and but one thing was lacking to make my enjoyment of this fairy region complete and that was some one to share it with me true bulger had an idea of its beauty for he testified his happiness at being once more in a warm land by executing some mad capers for my amusement and by scampering along the shore of the glowing river and barking at the stately fish as they slowly fanned the water with their many-coloured fins but i must admit that i longed for the princess schneeboule to keep me company but it was a rash wish for the warm air would have thrown her into convulsions of fear and she would have preferred to meet her death in the cool river rather than attempt to breathe such a fiery atmosphere by this time i had advanced several miles along the white shores of the glowing stream and feeling somewhat fatigued i was about to sit down on the jutting edge of a natural bench of rock which seemed almost placed on the river banks by human hands for human forms to rest upon and watch the wonderful play of tints and hues in this wide sweeping inlet when to my amazement i saw that a human creature was already sitting there his eyes were fixed upon the water and methought that his face which was gentle and placid wore a tired look certainly he was plunged into such deep meditation that he either took or feigned to take no notice of my approach bulger was inclined to dash forward and attract his attention by a string of ear-splitting barks but i shook my head this wanderer along the glowing stream of day wore rather a graceful cloak-like garment woven of some substance that shimmered in the light and so i concluded that it must be a mineral wool his head was bare and so were his legs to the knees his feet being shod with white metal sandals tied on with what looked like leathern thongs all in all he had a friendly though somewhat peculiar look about him and his attitude struck me as being that of a person either plunged into deep thought or possibly listening for some anxiously expected signal at any rate accustomed as i was to meet all sorts of people on my travels in the four corners of the globe i determined to make bold enough to interrupt the gentleman's meditations and wish him good morrow whom have i the pleasure of meeting in this beautiful section of the world within a world the man looked at me in a dazed sort of way and replied i really don't know i'm happy to say but sir thy name i insisted 
forgot it years ago was his remarkable answer but surely sir i exclaimed rather testily thou art not the sole inhabitant of this beautiful underworld thou hast kinsman wife family ay gentle stranger he replied in slow and measured tones there are people farther along the shore and they are good dear souls although i have forgotten their names and i have to a very faint recollection that two of these people are sons of mine stop no uh, their names are gone from me too i forgot them the day my own name slipped from my mind and as he uttered these words he threw his head back with a sudden jerk and i heard a strange click inside of it as if something had slipped from its place in that instant a mysterious expression used by that master of masters don Fung, flashed through my mind rattle brains yes that was it and now i felt sure that i was standing in the presence of one of the curious folk inhabiting the world within a world to whom don Fung had given the strange name of rattle brains or happy forgetters i was so delighted that i could barely keep myself from rushing up to this gentle visaged and mild-mannered person whose head had just given forth the sharp click and grasping him by the hand but i feared to shock him by such a friendly greeting and so i contented myself with crying out sir thou seest before thee none other than the famous traveller baron sebastian von trump but to my great amazement and greater chagrin he simply turned his strange eyes with the far-away look upon me for an instant and then resumed his contemplation of the beautifully tinted sheet of water as if i hadn't opened my mouth it was the most extraordinary treatment that i had experienced since my descent into the underworld and i was upon the point of resenting it as became a true knight and especially a von trump when don Fum's brief description of the rattlebrains or happy forgetters flitted through my mind said he by the exercise of their strong wills they have been busy for ages striving to unload their brains of the to them now useless stock of knowledge accumulated by their ancestors and the natural consequence has been that the brains of these curious folk who call themselves the happy forgetters relieved of all labour and strain of thought have absolutely shrunken rather than increased in size so that with many of the happy forgetters their brains are like the shrivelled kernel of a last year's nut and give forth a sharp click when they move their heads suddenly with a jerk as is often their wont for they take great pride in proving to the listener that they deserve the name of rattlebrain nor do i need remind thee o reader concluded don Fum, in his celebrated work on the world within a world that the chiefest among the happy forgetters is the man whose head gives forth the loudest and sharpest click for he it is who has forgotten most you can have but a faint idea dear friends of my delight at the prospect of spending some time among these curious people people who look with absolute dread upon knowledge as the one thing necessary to get rid of before happiness can enter the human heart no joy can equal the happy forgetters when upon clasping a friend's hand he finds that he has forgotten his very name and no day is well spent in this land at the close of which the inhabitant may not exclaim this day i succeeded in forgetting something that i knew yesterday at last the happy forgetter rose from his seat and calmly walked away without so much as wishing me good day but i was resolved not to be so easily gotten rid of so i called after him in a loud voice and bulger following my example raised a racket at his heels whereupon he faced about and remarked beg pardon i had quite forgotten thee i'm happy to say and thy name too i've forgotten that let me see art thou a radiate one of the animals in the water i was more than half inclined to lose my temper at this slur classing me a backboned animal with a mere jellyfish but under all the circumstances i thought it best to control myself for i could well imagine that from the size of my head and the utter absence of all click inside of it i was not destined to be a very welcome visitor among the happy forgetters and therefore swallowing my injured feelings i made a very low bow and begged this curious gentleman to be kind enough to conduct me to his people among whom i wished to abide for a few days end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter thirty two 
how we entered the land of the happy forgetters something more about these curious folk their dread of bulger and me only a stay of one day accorded us description of the pleasant homes of the happy forgetters the revolving door through which bulger and i are unceremoniously set outside of the domain of the rattlebrains all about the extraordinary things which happened to bulger and me thereafter once more in the open air of the upper world and then homeward bound the happy forgetter pursued his way calmly along the winding path that skirted the glowing river apparently and no doubt really unconscious of the fact that bulger and i were following close at his heels after half an hour or so of this silent tramp he suddenly came to a standstill and with his placid countenance turned toward the light seemed to be so far away in thought that for several moments i hesitated to address him but as there were no signs of his showing any disposition to come to himself i made bold to ask him the cause of the delay i am happy to say he remarked without so much as deigning to turn his head that i have forgotten which of these two roads leads to the homes of our people well this was a pleasant outlook to be sure and i don't know what we should have done had not bulger solved the difficulty for us by making choice of one of the paths and dashing on ahead with a bark of encouragement for us to follow when i assured the happy forgetter that he need have no fear as to the wisdom of the choice he gave a start of almost horror at the information for you must know dear friends that the happy forgetter has more head of knowledge than we have of ignorance to learn it is the mother of all discontent the source of all unhappiness the cause of all the dreadful ills that have come upon the world and the people in it the world said one of the happy forgetters to me sadly was perfectly happy once and man had no name for his brother and yet he loved him even as the turtle dove loves his mate although he has no names to call her by but alas one day this happiness came to an end for a strange malady broke out among the people they were seized with a wild desire to invent names for things even many names for the same thing and different ways of doing the same thing this strange passion grew so upon them that they spent their lives in making them in every possible way harder to live they built different roads to the same place they made different clothes for different days and different dishes for different feasts to each child they gave two three and even four different names and different shoes were fashioned for different feet and one family was no longer satisfied with one drinking gourd did they stop there nay they now busied themselves learning how to make different faces to different friends covering a frown with a smile and singing gay songs when their hearts were sad in a few centuries a brother could no longer read a brother's face and one half of the world went about wondering what the other half was thinking about hence arose misunderstandings quarrels feuds warfare man was no longer content to dwell with his fellow-man in the spacious caverns which kind nature had hollowed out for him piercing the mountains with winding passages beside which his narrow streets dwindled to merest pathways in the land of the happy forgetters care never comes to trouble sleep nor anxious thought to wear the dread mask of to-morrow happy the day on which this child of nature might exclaim since morn i've forgotten something i've unloaded my mind it's one thought lighter than it was he was the happiest of the happy forgetters who could honestly say i know not thy name nor when thou wast born nor where thou dwellest nor who thy kinsmen are i only know that thou art my brother and that thou wilt not see me suffer if i should forget to eat or perish of thirst if i forget to drink and that thou wilt bid me close my eyes if i should forget that i had laid me down to sleep bulger's and my arrival in the land of the happy forgetters filled the hearts of these curious folk with secret dread at sight of my large head they all began to tremble like children in the dark stricken with fear of boogie or goblin and with one voice they refused to permit me to sojourn a single brief half-hour among them but gradually this sudden terror passed off a bit and after a council held by a few of the younger men whose brains as yet completely filled their heads it was determined that i might bide for another day in their land but that then the revolving door should be opened and bulger and i be thrust outside of their domain from what don foom had written about the happy forgetters i knew only too well that it would be useless for me to attempt to reverse this decree so i held my peace except to thank them for this great favour shown me 
the daylight if i may call it so now began to wane or rather the thousands of light-giving creatures swarming in the river now began to draw in their long tentacles close their flower-like bodies and slowly sink to the bottom of the stream i was quite anxious to see whether the happy forgetters would make any attempt to light up their cavernous homes or whether they would simply creep off to bed and sleep out the long hours of pitchy darkness to my surprise i overheard the clicking of flints on all sides and in a moment or so a thousand or more great candles made of mineral wax with asbestos wicks were lighted and the great chambers of white marble were soon aglow with these soft and steady flame the happy forgetters were strictly vegetable eaters feeding upon the various fungus plants growing in these caverns in great profusion together with a very nutritious and pleasant tasting jelly made from a hardened gum of vegetable origin which abounded in the crevices of certain rocks there was still another source of food namely the nests of certain shellfish which they built against the face of the rock just above the surface of the water these dissolved in boiling water made an excellent broth very much like the soup from edible birds nests the clothes worn by the happy forgetters were entirely woven from mineral wool which in these caverns gave a long and strong fibre of astonishing softness the rattle brains were tolerably good metal workers too but contented themselves with fashioning only such articles as were actually necessary for daily use their beds were stuffed with dried seaweed and lichens and bulger and i passed a very comfortable night as i was forbidden to speak aloud to ask a question or to walk abroad unless in company with one of the selectmen i was not sorry when the moment came for the revolving door to be opened the happy forgetters had been led to believe that bulger and i were a thousand times more dangerous than scaly monsters or black-winged vampires and hence they held themselves aloof from us the children hiding behind their mothers and the mothers peering through crack and crevice at us the size of my head inspired them with a nameless dread and even the half-dozen of the younger and more courageous drew aside instinctively to let me pass for the first time in my life i was an object of horror to my fellow-creatures but i had no hard thoughts against them timid children of nature that they were to them i was as terrible an object as the torch-armed demon of destruction would be to us were he let loose in one of our fair cities of the upper world and now the guard of happy forgetters had halted in front of what seemed to be a huge cask fashioned of solid marble and set one half within the white wall of the cavern to which they had led me but on second glance i saw that there was a row of square holes around its bulge like those in the top of a capstan the happy forgetters now disappeared for a moment and when they joined me again each bore in hand a metal bar the end of which lies set in one of these holes and then at a signal from the leader the huge half-circle of marble began to turn noiselessly around exactly like a capstan as each man's lever came to the wall he shifted it to the front again suddenly to my amazement i saw that the great marble cask was hollow like a sentry-box and you may judge of my feelings dear friends upon being politely requested to step inside did i refuse to obey not i it would have been useless for was not the whole tribe of rattle-brains there to lay hands upon me and thrust me in so taking off my hat and making a low bow to the little group of happy forgetters i stepped within the hollow cask and bulger did the same but not with so good a grace as his master for casting an angry glance at the inhospitable dwellers in these chambers of white marble he growled and laid bare his teeth to show his contempt for them now the great marble cask began to revolve the other way and in a moment it was back in place again i heard several sharp clicks as if a number of huge spring latches had snapped into place and then all was silent as the tomb and i had almost said as dark too but no i could not say that for i looked out into a low tunnel which ran past the niche in which bulger and i were standing and to my more than wonder it was dimly lighted i stepped out into it it was as round as a cannon bore and just high enough for me to stand erect and now i discovered whence the light proceeded in the cracks and crevices of its walls grew vast masses of those delicate light-giving fungus rootlets the glow of which was so strong that i had no difficulty in reading and writing on my tablets in fact i stood there for several minutes making entries by the light of these bunches of glowing rootlets then the thought flashed through my mind which way shall i turn 
to the right or to the left bulger comprehended the cause of my vacillation and made haste to come to my rescue after sniffing the air first in one direction and then in the other he chose the right hand and i followed without a thought of questioning his wisdom strange to say he had not advanced more than a few hundred rods before i noticed that there was a strong current of air blowing through the tunnel in the direction bulger had taken every moment it increased in violence fairly lifting us from our feet and bearing us along through this narrow bore made by nature's own hands and lighted too by lamps of her own fashioning the motion of the air through this vast pipe caused bursts of mighty tones as if pealed forth by some gigantic organ played by giant hands it was strange but yet i felt no terror as i listened to this unearthly music although its depth of tone jarred painfully upon my eardrums by the dim light of the luminous rootlets i could see bulger just ahead of me and i was content no shiver of fear ran down my back or robbed my limbs of their full power to resist the ever-increasing pressure of the air but as it grew stronger and stronger half of my own accord and half because bulger set the example i broke into a run our pace once quickened it was impossible for me to slow up again on on in a mad race my feet scarcely touching the bottom of the tunnel i sped along while the great pipe through which i was borne on the very wings of the gale sent forth its deep and majestic peal there was something strangely and mysteriously exciting in this race and all that kept me from enjoying it to my full bent was the thought that a sudden increase in the violence of the blast might toss me violently on my face and possibly break an arm for me or injure me in some serious way all at once the deep pealing forth of the organ-like tone ceased and in its stead came the awful sound of rushing water before i had time to think it was upon me striking me like a terrific blow from some gigantic fist wearing a boxing glove the next instant i was caught up like a cork on a mountain torrent swayed from side to side twisted turned sucked down and cast up again whirled over and over tossed and tumbled rolled along like a wheel my arms and legs the spokes wonderful to relate i did not lose consciousness as this terrible current shot me like a stick of timber through the flume whether i knew not only that the speed and volume went ever on increasing until at last the tumultuous torrent filled the tunnel and robbed me of light of breath of life of everything including my faithful and loving bulger how long it lasted this fearful ride in the arms of these mad waters rushing as if for life or death through this narrow bore i know not i only know that my ears were suddenly assailed with a mighty whiz and rush of water as through the nozzle of some gigantic hose and that i was shot out into the glorious sunshine out onto the grand free open air of the upper world and sent flying up toward the dear blue sky with its flecks of fleecy cloudlets and bulger some twenty feet ahead of me and that then with a gracefully curved flight through the soft and balmy air of harvest time we both were gently dropped into a quiet little lake nestled at the foot of a hillside yellow with ripened corn in a moment or so we had swum ashore bulger wanted to halt and shake the water from his thick coat but i couldn't wait for that wet as he was i clasped him to my heart while he showered caresses on me but not a word was said not a sound was uttered we both of us too happy to speak and if you have ever been in that state dear friends you know how it feels i can't describe it to you at this moment some men and boys clad in the garb of the russian peasant came racing across the fields to see what i was about no doubt for i had stripped off my heavy outside clothing and was spreading it out in the sun to dry upon sight of these red-cheeked children of the upper world i was so overcome with joy that for a moment or so i couldn't get a syllable across my lips but making a great effort i cried out fathers brothers where am i speak my dear souls in northeastern siberia little soul replied the eldest of the party not far from the banks of the obi but whence comest thou by saint nicholas i believe thou wast spit out of the spouting well what art thou doing here alone i paid no attention to the question i was thinking of something else of more importance to me to wit my splendid achievement the marvellous underground journey i had just completed fully five hundred miles in length passing completely under the ural mountains after a short stay at the nearest village 
i engaged the best guide that was to be had and crossed the earls by the pass in the most direct line re-entered russia and made haste to join the first government train on its way to st petersburg having dispatched a courier with letters to my beloved parents informing them of my good health and whereabouts i passed several weeks very pleasantly in the russian capital and then by easy stages set out for home the elder baron came as far as riga to meet me and brought me the best of news from castle trump that my dear mother was in perfect health and that she and every man woman and child in and about the castle were anxiously awaiting to give me a real german welcome back home and here dear friends mit herzlichen gris bulger and i take our leave of you end of chapter thirty two end of baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood